Whew, that, that, those announcements, this is our home. I mean, <laughs> this is what it's like in Alleluia when we have a general community gathering. Trying to fit all the announcements in yeah. is a challenge. We still haven't figured quite out how to do it. Um, but I want to start out by thanking you all uh, for who you are. You have no idea what a blessing it is for my, Marie and I to be here. Um, you, we are definitely kindred spirits. Um, I found out, I didn't realize our covenant was almost identical till last week, but we out of the same life that you do, the same promises. And uh, our first trip here three and a half years ago was life-changing for us and, f and for uh, our community. As I've been praying all week, I got an image, uh, and I don't, it's just an image of a, a beautiful, quiet lake with a, something dropping into the center of it and ripples going out everywhere. And I really think that's an image for servants of Jesus, that the Lord is using you and sending you out all over the place in ripples, affecting different places around. And I know you've affected our community deeply. The, uh, the worship here is incredible. You maybe already know that, but since you're in it all the time, you may not know it. But it was last time when we came, uh, we had 10 young people with us. And I, I went to each person and I said, what was the one thing that impressed you the most <laughs> about servants of Jesus? And every single young person told me privately, the worship. Um, you worship the Lord in such a tremendous way, and we're trying to catch up. <laughs> to the way you do it, and, and, and also the, the tr tremendous um, outreach, the way you use the gifts to, to, uh, to reach people. We were already on that track, but we got like a booster shot uh, when we came here because seeing how you do it uh, is in, in impelled us to do the same. And I could go on and on uh, of how you've affected us, just all the way across the, the ocean. And not to mention now intermarriages happening. So um, that's definitely affected us. But um, so thank you. What I, what I really want to do is I prayed about this talk because I was given freedom to talk about whatever I felt the Lord to give me. And, I, and, this, is, and this is really what I want to do is create in all of us, all of you, a deeper thirst for Jesus. Um, Jesus wants to give himself completely to us, but he'll only come where there's desire and thirst. If, if, there's, if it's not there, he's, he's just not going to knock your door down. He really wants this in us. And I thought of a, an analogy uh, there's a, if, you, if, you, if somebody were to give you a tree to plant in your yard and it was a three-foot sapling and you planted it and you watered it and you took care of it, after 10 years, you expect that that tree, that little sapling, would at least have grown a, a few feet. Well, if you went out after 10 years and that tree was the same size is when you planted it, you'd say, something's wrong here. <laughs> something's really wrong. This, you know, you could even use the severe word, this, this tree is retarded. This, something's wrong. And, and the truth is, we look at that and we know in, in, the, na in the natural something's wrong. But when we look at our spiritual life and we don't see growth, we don't think that. We just think, well, we're just moving along. If we haven't, if we can't see growth, it's okay, you know. We just, we stay at the same level that we've been at for year and year and year and year. And there's something wrong with that. And I think Joe said it earlier. He said, you know, what God started, he starts with a bang, with the Holy Spirit, with the baptism of the Spirit, and then some on the line, we pull back. And we stop growing, and, and there's something wrong with that. 
And I heard this scripture earlier in the prophecy, John 10, 10. God came to give us abundant life, a life to the full. So if we're not experiencing that, something has to be wrong. <clears throat> so what I want to do is talk a little bit about how to... Uh, and, and I know I'm talking to the choir, but I want to talk to you about going into a deeper level of prayer in your life. Maybe go deeper with the Lord in a way maybe that you haven't even experienced up to this point. Many of you have, I'm sure. But St. Paul insisted that we are to live so intensely that we are to be filled with the utter fullness of God and nothing less. So we're destined for this deep communion with God. Everybody in here is destined for this. And this should be your heart's desire. You know, the, the Psalm 27 says, The one thing I long for, this I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to see the face of the Lord, to see his beauty. I remember when I was first baptized in the Spirit, I was 16 years old and in a Catholic high school. And uh, my teacher, I had a psychology professor who was a priest and all we, uh, me and uh, several other people in the, in the class started talking about Jesus because we got baptized in the Spirit. And he thought something was wrong with us. <laughs> and one day he took us out to lunch, and he wanted to try to find out what, what was this we were talking about. Why were we so excited about Jesus? He thought something was wrong with us, literally. And uh, I remember him asking me, Dan, what do you want to do with your life? Now, I'm about 16 or 17 years old, and I know he was looking for some, like, what, what's your career? What, you know? And I, I just looked at him. I said, Father Don, all I want to do is be a saint. That's my goal. That's it. You know, a disi in other words, a disciple, a real committed disciple. That's it. And he just shook his head and, and, and carried on another conversation. I think, how do, you, how do we become saints? You know, how do we become the kind of disciples that Jesus really wants us to be? And I've just, I have found out that it really is going deeper with the Lord. It's going into deeper communion with Jesus. There is no other way. And it means spending more time with him in prayer. Now, I want to read to you a, a, a quote from... Uh, somebody who's one of my favorite authors. Uh, some of you probably know who Mike Bickle is. Uh, he's a pastor of, in IHOP, started the IHOP church. I actually had the privilege of having, uh, meeting him and spending time with him and having dinner with him this a couple months ago. We had a great conversation about his, some of his writings, but this is what, from one of his books called The Pleasures of Loving God. And this is going to try to help me make the point I'm trying to make here. This is what Mike Bickle said. He said, I was doing a large conference in Europe with a well-known man of God, and I witnessed powerful demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. After the meeting, I could hardly wait to ask him what he had felt when during the service, a lady screamed out in joy after being instantly healed. But I was very surprised by his answer. He said, I was glad for her, but personally, I have grown accustomed to such demonstrations. Then he continued, I still feel the same way in my lonely hotel room after these meetings. I feel bored. He went on to describe his bitterness from various disappointments that had a hold of him. And I remember thinking, surely doing miracles in Jesus' name would cause life to be filled with excitement. And I blurted out these words. And he said, at first, that's how we all feel. After we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we all feel like we could just go on forever. He said then, but over time, we are confronted with our own spiritual bankruptcy if we do not encounter God in a deep and more continual way. And then Mike Bickle goes on to say, 
At one time, I thought that being anointed in ministry would keep a person's heart encouraged in God. And now I've learned that this simply isn't true. A deeply satisfied soul, a personal sense of meaning and significance, and a rich store of divine pleasure can only come through the intimate knowledge of God himself. And Mike Bickle in his book goes on to describe then his, and you can read it for yourself in The Pleasures of Loving God. Uh, he had been in ministry for 25 years. And, and then he goes on to describe this incredible encounter with God's love that he had after 25 years of ministry and how it completely changed and defined the re- his ministry for the rest of his life. Now, I, something very similar happened to me, and, and, it's, and, I'll sh- and I want to share a little bit of it, because I, I grew up, I'm a cradle Catholic, I grew up, that's my tradition, and I, I grew up doing all the right things. I mean, I was the model kid. Uh, I got baptized in the Spirit at 16 and went off to seminary when I was 17, you know. And I, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I was, I was just perfect. <laughs> in, my, in my own head, you know. And, um, but as life went on, and of course I ended up entering, I left seminary and after seven years and came into to covenant community, to join community, because that's where the call of God had on my life. That's a whole other story, but I ended up, and I met Marie. She was a single in household, and we ended up in household together, and next thing you know, we were married. So, but, and again, doing all the right stuff, going to church every Sunday, you know, praying regularly, um, going to the prayer meetings, you know, being a good community person, doing all the tithing, living our covenant, you know, and this went on, and I'm having kid after kid after kid, and, you know, and I'm, life is good, you know, it's pretty good, and I'm trying to do what God wants, but you know what, I, there was something I was missing, and I didn't, I could feel it. Every time I would read a, an inspiring biography by some, you know, either, either Catholic or, or evangelical uh, saint, I would say, what it, this was the question, what do they have? When you read them, you get stirred up, and you get so excited, and you say, well, I want to be that way. But they've got something I don't have. And what is it? What is the thing they have that I don't have? Because I'm baptized in the Spirit, I'm living in covenant life, and still something was missing. And so I still recall I went on a retreat, and I went, and at this point, my wife, Marie, was pregnant with Teresa. She was our last one. And, and I was just getting ready to, you know, our youngest one up to that point was just starting school. So I was thinking, okay, we're going to have a break now. And uh, I'm going to be able to pray as much as I want and do all this stuff. And then we found out Teresa's on the way. So I went to the spiritual director of the retreat, and I said, I'm very frustrated. I'm sorry, Teresa, this <laughs> is not, not about you. But I said, I thought I was going to have, life was going to go easier, but now my, my wife's expecting again, and I thought I was going to really become a spiritual person having all this time to pray. And he looked at me, and I still don't know if this was the Holy Spirit or the devil. I'm not sure. But he said to me, you know what, you're just going to have to wait another 20 years. He really said that. And I was so angry. I said, no. I've been waiting to go deeper with God, and I want to go deeper with God. And just because he's chosen to give me a wife and six children as my vocation, this is, this is not a punishment, you know, because you didn't stay being a priest. So I, I said, God, I don't accept that. I won't accept that. And whatever, this is what I started with, thirst, thirsting for God, wanting it. I was so desperate for more of God, I said, God, I will do anything, anything to get more of you. And this is what happened to Mike Bickle. 
in this in his book. So, a couple months later, Teresa's born. Marie is a nurse. She works nights. So, guess who got to do the feedings at night? I would get up at night in in. At 2 a.m., I still remember this. I said, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend time in prayer with you. I, I don't, you know, I don't have any time, but I'm going to make it. So at 2 a.m., I got in and got Teresa, and I would feed her a bottle, and I put a crucifix up in front of me and a, a candle, a blessed candle, and I would rock her for 20 minutes. And I looked at that face of Jesus, and I said, Jesus, I love you. And I'm going to do this every night, every night. I'm just going to tell you I love you. And if nothing happens, fine. But I'm going to do it anyway. And then it, it happened. When, I don't know what to say, how to describe what it is. But the love of God started pouring into me in a level of love of God that I hadn't experienced since I was baptized in the Spirit. Only it was different this time. This was something God wanted to keep going. And that was 20 years ago. Um, I found out that there's different kinds of prayer. I, I mean, I know you all know there's different kinds of prayer. In, in my tradition, in the Catholic Catechism, they have a whole section on prayer they talk about vocal prayer, they talk about meditative prayer, and they talk about contemplative prayer. Now, I never in my life, sorry, Father Kevin, wherever you are, but I never heard a, 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 a homily on contemplative prayer. I wouldn't have known what it was. I just thought it was a form of meditation. But I found out this is what is called, and, and the catechism spends more time talking about this kind of prayer than the other two combined, believe it or not. I found out that this is coming into the presence of the Lord. This is what happens, this, I think, what happens when we worship together. We come into the presence of the Lord, but the Lord wants this kind of prayer happening in our lives every day, in our own lives, personally, in our own prayer times. You know, He wants us to have this breakthrough of experiencing His love. And, you know, it leads to... Um, it leads to uh, the dark night. Contemplative prayer actually is the dark night. And yet, in this not, again, it's so hard to describe, but it's without feeling God, you know he's there. And it's this form of deep prayer that transforms the heart. You know, the famous uh, St. Teresa of Avila in our Catholic tradition talks about you can either haul the water up from the well by hand, which is an awful lot of work, or you can just let the rain fall and do it without any effort. And that's what happens. When, when we enter into the presence of God in prayer like this, he starts the transformation in our hearts. The things that we've been working on for year after year after year, that we've been trying to pull those weeds, he actually gets to the very roots and pulls them out without, I want to say, without any effort. He just sovereignly does it. And this, it's, it's unbelievable. And again, this is what, and what's amazing is this is happening, this started to happen with many members in our community. It was a grace. We weren't even looking for it. It happened to evangelicals, it happened to Catholics, it happened to young people, it happened to old people, and it's still happening. We're experiencing, uh, we experience this, uh, a lot of this depth of, of deep presence of the Lord with us. Now, how do we, I do want to say a few things about how does this happen? How do we, you know, because this kind of prayer, you can't make God do this. It's a gift. But the thing we can do is in Mark 4.4, 4, it talks about prepare the soil. We have to prepare the soil. And we want the kind of soil that's going to produce 30, 60, 100 fold. And so the two things that I think about that are, there's, we could probably go around the whole room and add ingredients to the soil, but these are the two things that I want to talk about as I, as I begin to wind down here. One of the ingredients we have to get into our soil 
is time. We really have to make time to pray. It's not, it's, it's just not an option. If we're going to grow, if that sapling is still three feet tall in your backyard in a spiritual sense, then it's because we're not praying. We're really not spending the time with the Lord. Um, you know, just a couple scriptures. Mark 1, 35. In the morning, long before, long before dawn, he got up and went to a lonely place absorbed in prayer. Now, you notice it doesn't say in scripture, long before dawn, he rolled over. <laughs> because that's what most of us do. That's what I did, you know. When I, when I heard this scripture one time, I was in a, uh, a priest was preaching on this scripture, and it, I was so convicted that because I was, the snooze button was my worst enemy, you know, I pushed that thing over and over and over again. But when I heard that scripture, God did something and it convicted my heart, and I said, Lord, with your grace, I will never, ever push that snooze button again. And from that moment on, I never did. And I had the grace to get up early. Now, I'm not saying everybody's got to get up early to do this, but I'm just saying we've got to find a way to make the time to, to, to spend real time with the Lord, deep intimacy with him. Luke 5.16, he would always go off to some place where he could be, be praying alone. If we want to be deeply converted and if we want to become a saint or a disciple and be transformed into Christ, if we want to build God's kingdom for the long haul, we all have to go deeper in our prayer lives with the Lord. And I'm convinced that's why some people fall out of the... I, I know, because I know a lot of our own people in the community, but occasionally you, people, you quit seeing people at the, the gatherings, or they quit coming, and it's because they quit praying. They really quit praying the way they were supposed to. Um, and then the, the second ingredient is this. And I, I, don't know, I don't know what word you might want to use. I use the word, we have to be learned to be recollected. I don't know, uh, that's probably a Catholic term. But recollection simply means withdrawal of the mind and the heart from created things to attend to and listen to God's voice within us. And maybe another way to say this is we need to fast from the popular culture to be able to listen to God's voice. We really have to, in our, our culture is inundated with distractions. I mean, there are so many distractions today that even I didn't have growing up. Um, you know, we have to have less radio, less TV, less social media devices. Um, you know, and if we have them, learn how to use them in a way that it doesn't distract us. You know, it's really, I, I found out that now that I've got a cell phone where I get all my emails and dings and, and uh, texts and things, I have to, I have to, because I was going, I was having text mess going on and, and all kinds of emailing going on in the middle of my prayer time before I realized what was happening. So that's called not being recollected. That's called distraction. That's, we have to find ways to put these things aside so that we can really hear the voice of the Lord and not be distracted. And that takes a lot of work and discipline, but we can do it. Um, there might be other things in our life, you know, that, that prevent us from hearing the Lord. It not, might not be just a recollection. It could be, you know, some kind of, it can even be a good habit. You know, I say a good habit, you know, it's good to have uh, hobbies. But when the hobby starts becoming the idol, and we start missing, putting God's work aside because of our hobby that God's called us to, then something's wrong, you know? Um, a good friend of mine in the community, just, this just happened, you know, he, he, he's a good 
uh, deer hunting buddy. And we were out hunting the other a uh, uh, few weeks ago, and he and I knew he likes beer. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I know because of pastorally, his his wife told me I think he likes beer too much, and so. I'm thinking maybe I need to talk to this brother and, and while we're out deer hunting. And before I could even say anything to him, he said, you know what? He said, God spoke to me the other day in my prayer time, and he said, he told me to give up drinking for a year. I looked at him, and I said, and what did you say? <laughs> he said, I'll do it for you, Lord. And he said, and I've started to do this. He said, and I found out I can hear God better. I can, I can respond to him better. I'm a better husband. And he said, I, I don't know if I'm going to go back to drinking, but he said, at least for this year. I, I, and he said, God's given me a grace to do it. And he was willing to, he, I know this brother, he loves God so much that he was willing to give up something that he really loved to be able to go further with God. And that's exactly what's happening in his life. So God wants us to have a soil in our heart to prepare him to be able to hear him speak and touch our hearts deeply with his love. And, it, and again, once this thing happens, you can't go, I mean, you can go back, but you never want to go back. You know, it's the difference between looking at your watch and waiting for your prayer time to get over so you can go on with life to... When, when God touches you in this deep way, oh my gosh, I've only got 30 minutes left. I've got, Lord, I'm sorry, where's the time going? It, it literally, this is what God does when this form of, this desire takes over and he rushes in. It's incredible. And it gives you the zeal, the zeal to do anything God asks you to do. The people in our community that are on fire for Jesus and doing twice as much as everybody else are the people who are experiencing the depth of God's love in a deep prayer life. It's just, it's, it's the result of it. They get way more done than the rest of us. Um, one more analogy, and I'm about to close. Um, and this is, when I talk about the soil, some of us... Even in this gathering, you know, when you hear, you know, I'm, t I'm speaking today, but usually I know when I've been here before, it's been Joe or somebody's teaching. Everybody here's soil is a little different. You know, some of you have soil that, you know, it's like a big paper towel. Uh, we, in, in the United States, we have something called bounty paper towels. They're like, they can soak up a whole bathtub. And you don't even have to wring it out. You just, it just soaks it up. And some of us are like wax paper. We, we can't absorb anything. We, we have a hard time. And most of us are somewhere in between. But God wants to make our hearts like bounty paper towels. He wants our hearts so that even if the dullest speaker is up here or whatever, that you're, you're, your heart is so open and ready to soak in whatever that you're going to take it all in and you're going to be changed. And that's what God wants. He wants those kinds of hearts in us. Um, so I'm, back to Mike Bickle. Is he, one of the things he says in, in that book, he says, we cannot really expect to press into greater depths of the Spirit if we go up to God's bank casually and say, I want the deep things of your wealth, but I only have a few minutes to spend with you. For me, there's a driving passion in my heart that whispers all the time, there's more, more. There's more than what I already know, and there's more that it, than I already have. I know there's more because of those who have encountered it and share about it. 
And I want to do everything I can. I want to invite us here to do everything we can to get behind that veil because we have got to see his face. He wants us to experience and see his face. And so I pray today that a desire for spending more time alone with the Lord will overwhelm our hearts. I don't think there's a greater gift we could give the Lord back to him at Christmas than a deep desire, thirst, and hunger to spend more time with him alone. So I pray today that he may grant you, Lord Jesus, grant all of us the courage and the perseverance to never draw back, never pull back, always say yes to you. May your gift to Jesus this Christmas and New Year be to spend more time with him, and may a desire for more of him cause you to do whatever it takes to go deeper with him. Amen.